Good morning. God has blessed us to be able to come to this place this morning and to do, worship him in spirit and in truth. I am so thankful to be able to worship with the brothers and sisters here uh, in, in, in Merkel. I am very comfortable always around brothers and sisters that are in Christ Jesus. And to be able to reconnect with brothers and sisters to be able to worship God in spirit and in truth is just is just a blessing. I think the tablet is doing something something different there, but um, I'm I'm just so thankful to be able to worship. And, and Brother Greg said some things that uh, I want to start off with, just to let you know that all of us are really on the same side. In other words. All of the rural churches that were represented at that men's fellowship, we all had an outstanding time. And it, it occurred to me, you know, why is it that we don't try to encourage each other more? Why is it that, that, that Sunday mornings are the most isolated time that, that we can have in the Lord's church? And I, I'm, I'm making a renewed commitment. Trent, you're going to hear this again uh, next week in the pulpit. So when you hear it next week, act surprised. Um, but but I'm, I'm renewing the commitment that all of us, especially in these rural areas, we need to make a better, a more deliberate, concerted effort to support each other and to build each other up in your most high and holy faith. Thank you to the elders who... Um, have reached out and given me this opportunity. Thank you, Merkel Church, for your reception. Bible class uh, was outstanding, and it won't take you long to realize two things about me. And if you just met me this morning or if you've known me for a long time, there's two things you need to know about me. Number one, I love the Lord and I love his word. That's number one. Number two, Richard kind of alluded to it, and I really wanted him to shush, but he wouldn't shush. I ain't got no sense. <laughs> okay, I don't. I just believe that life, as we live life, we ought to be positive people. We shouldn't look like we sucking on lemons and eating crab apples all day long. Christians ought to be some of the happiest people around. And so uh, I just don't believe in not having a good time. Thank you for the invitation this morning. Thank you to the eldership. Thank you to Brother Greg, who really has extended uh, the right hand of fellowship. And I look forward to this, and I'm calling this new beginnings uh, between the church in Trent and the church here in Merkel. This morning, I want to call our attention to Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through verse 37. You are very familiar um, with this. This is the, the story or the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I understand your theme for this year, for these lessons, and I think it's a good one talking about love, and we need to extend love to, to and I said this in Bible class this morning, we need to extend love unconditionally to people that don't look like us, don't act like us, don't smell like us. We need to be God's ambassadors when it comes to showing love. And I, I couldn't think of a better spot in the New Testament than the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because when you look at this story, Jesus turns the Jewish system on its ear. And he really reaches out to some people who were really tunnel visioned and, and, and had a narrow focus. And he had the audacity, he had the unmitigated gall to make a Samaritan the hero of the story. He did that for a reason, and let's, let's read what the word has to say. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to verse 37. The Bible says on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you, how do you read it? And he answered, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And he added, he said, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus responds, he says, you've answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. 
But it, it almost seems like that answer didn't really, didn't really set well with the man because verse 29 says he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Almost like Jesus' answer to the question didn't suit him. You ever met anybody like that? Um, when, I was, when I was in school, um, all through high school, and then um, not so much in college because I was paying for it, but, 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 in, but in high school especially, I would ask questions not for the sake of learning or not for the sake of knowledge drove my teachers crazy. Um, sometimes I would just want to be a Weisenheimer, and I would just ask the question simply to cause spite and just ask the question, Almost Jesus knew that about, about our friend here. This man didn't want to ask the question just so he could learn something. Luke's, uh, the Bible says here he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and, and when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes and they, they beat him. And then they went away, and, and they said, Luke says, he left him for half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man, and he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him, and he passed by on the other side. And watch this. Here is where the story really gets good, where it really gets interesting. And I can about see knowing the Jewish system like I do and like you do, right about now they were grinding their teeth. As my granddad used to say, they were mad enough to chew nails and spit tacks. A Samaritan, as he traveled, came there. And where the man was, he went and he saw him. And when he saw him, Luke says, he took, he took pity on him and he, and he went over to him and he, he bandaged his wounds and he poured on the first aid kit of the day. He poured on oil and wine and he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and, and gave it to the innkeeper and he said, look after him. And when I return... I'll reimburse you for any extra expense that you have. Which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man that fell into the hands of the robber? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And what Jesus says is the key to this parable and, and the central thought for the next few minutes that, that I want to work on, that I want to uh, uh, apply for us today. Jesus says, go and do likewise. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, for all of your blessings. We're thankful to be here this morning that we can study your word, but not just to study it, to call words or to show off our intellectual prowess or or lack thereof, but Lord, that we want to just know and serve you better. We really want to be your hands, and we really want to be your feet, and we want to do everything that we can to serve you because you loved us by sending your son, Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, and all we can do is still yet lacking compared to your goodness and your mercy. Special blessing on those who are uh, under the sound of my voice, Lord, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to your sight. Oh, Lord, you're our rock and our redeemer. Thank you, Lord, for this and all your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. The Spirit leads us to manifest loving actions to everyone. And we already know that love comes from God. And so it's no wonder that Jesus continues to emphasize over and over in the New Testament, especially this idea, this concept of love. And this concept of love really doesn't have any of the, the, the social or the, the human boundaries that we put on it. See, a lot of times I'll, I'll help you if you look like me. I'll help you if you talk like me. I'll help you if you and I already have a relationship. But what about the person who really doesn't look 
like you. And over and over again, we're told, love our enemies, love our enemies, be good to those who, who, who abuse you. But my question to start with is, do we? Do we really do that? How much good work do we miss trying to help people in spite of our own personal inhibitions? This, this universal love extends to those who are different than us, who even might disagree with us, but we still have to extend love. And guess what? When you're faking, people will know it. See, I, I maintain I maintain something. I maintain that for far too long, we as members of the Churches of Christ, I maintain that we have talked a good game, but our actions have not backed it up. And the reason that people uh, laugh at us and tell stories about us or, or don't want to become Christians and embrace God, could it be that they've lived with us so long? They see us. They know us. And there's nothing appealing in our lives that will attract them to Christ. And that, brothers and sisters, is a sad testimony. So in this, in this parable this morning, I want you to notice four things. First of all, and I think it relates to us as well, we, we've got a problem. And Jesus now addresses this problem. This lawyer is asking these questions not for the sake of learning. This lawyer is asking these questions really for the sake of trying to entrap Jesus. And Jesus then turns the table on him. This lawyer approaches Jesus and he asks a question. And they're really, in one question, it's kind of wrapped up to be two questions that's, that's within this entire phrase. These two questions really have to do with what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And then he asked Jesus, you know, who then is my neighbor? You know, one question would have been okay the other one is a result of him not getting the answer that he wanted to the first question. You remember growing up and you'd ask your parents a question and it would not be the answer that you got back. And if you were raised where I was raised, that was the only answer you got. In fact, I can say it now because um, parents are long gone and I'm uh, Mom's still here, but they're not, they're not in Texas. They're in Georgia, so I can, I can say it now. You better like the answer that you got. Matter of fact, you better act like you liked it. <laughs> if you didn't, there were some repercussions. And now the child abuse, the people, that was when, when parents could, in fact, discipline. Okay, I'm going to leave that alone. When parents could discipline their own children. See, you got to understand something. There's two constructs here. Number one, he was asking, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Because he didn't like the answer that Jesus gave to that question. Then he tried to be smart and he flipped it and he said, okay, all right, who then is my neighbor? And understanding that problem, Jesus takes the social construct of the day and he flips it so that the hero of the story is somebody who is a social outcast. Stay with me because this is a lesson for us as well. Aside from the problem, now Jesus lays out the, the parameters. I hope you can, I hope you can see this. this. This social diagram really represents from the inside out the, the social class of people. They had respect for the priests, then the Levites, then the Jews, then they put the tax collectors in the, in the same group with the social outcasts and the sinners. I, thought, I think that's funny. I think that's funny. Then they put the Samaritans and then they put the Gentiles. Jesus knew this. And then that's how Jesus uses, that's what he uses as the bedrock or the foundation for the story. And what, what, this, what this lawyer was really trying to ask is the same question that if we're not careful, we want to ask, okay, Lord, um, how far do I really need to go to be a Christian? <laughs> I mean, I know I'm supposed to love people, but, but give me the parameters. Give me, how far do I really need to go? And Jesus digs in and he gives them the idea of this particular story. In this story, there's three players. We'll take them one at a time. 
the, the players really have to do with the characters of the day. Number one, you got to deal with some robbers. And the robbers on this road between Jerusalem and Jericho, it was a very steep road. Everybody knew it. It was a bad part of the the town. It was the hood, if you will. And and in fact, the name of this road was, was affectionately called the Way of Blood. It was a section of town that really you knew you had to be careful if you were traveling that particular road. So this was a very believable story for those who were listening to it. The second group that you got to deal with is the religious. That's the priests and the Levites. And I I find it interesting here, those who we, we really need to understand this culture, you know, if you were a religious person back then, you didn't touch anything dead. Matter of fact, if it looked dead, you didn't even touch it. Why? Because that would violate your worship. When it comes to your standing, especially in the religious order, when it comes to your standing, when it comes to being a religious priest or a religious Levite. But there's something that I think for years we miss in this text. See, this priest could have used the excuse, look, I ain't touching because I don't want that to violate my social standing. I still got to go to church. I still got to work. But there's something in this text that I think we we missed. You know, that would have kept him from serving in the temple. But the priest and the Levite were going down the road. Jerusalem sat on a hill. So if they were going down, they were heading away from Jerusalem to somewhere else. That wouldn't have affected their worship because worship was going up to Jerusalem and they were going down down. They flat stinking, or if I can say flat and stinking in the same sentence, they flat stinking didn't want to get involved. But they used the excuse of their religious standing to do nothing. Does that sound familiar? How much good work did you pass on the way coming to church today? How many opportunities to serve do we, do we miss Because we've got someone else to do after worship. See, Jerusalem sat on a hill, so it stands to reason they were going down this road, so they were going away, so they really didn't have an excuse not to stop and to help this man. You know, even in the old law, as absurd as it was, in Exodus 23, they even had a law and a rule, a part of the law and a rule that you, you were supposed to stop and help a man's donkey if the donkey was in trouble. Listen to this, 23, 4, and 5. If you encounter your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, you must all, by all means return it to him. And if you see the donkey of someone who, who hates you fallen under its load, you must not ignore him, but be sure to help him with it. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Time out. I'm supposed to stop and help the donkey of my enemy, but a human being on a road got to fend for himself. Do you see how absurd the old law and the old system was? That's why Jesus comes and Jesus is now saying, in, in essence, Christianity is far superior. The new law that I bring and I usher in is far superior to this old law. I am the fulfillment of this new law. Look how absurd. You can help a donkey, you can help an animal, but you couldn't help a human being. And then look at this righteous man. The righteous man just happened to be the good Samaritan. And, and you, you already know this. Samar- Samaritans were kind of a inferior mixed race um, when it comes to the, the Jewish mind. The, 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 these Samaritans were really considered to be I hate to say this, less than human, um, but if you are looked at as less than human, don't look at the person, look at the actions. Look at his actions. This Samaritan showed three things. Number one, 
he showed compassion. And I think this is interesting. For, for a mixed race or a half-breed, look at what he did compared to what the religious leaders didn't do. He moved towards the injured man. You remember the story? What the religious people do? They didn't even go towards him. The book says that they passed by on the other side. See, this tells me that this good Samaritan took the initiative. And this is significant to me, brothers and sisters. This is so significant because if we want to build relationships with people, we can't move away from them. We got to move to them. Okay, I'll let that soak for a moment. Maybe that was a bit too much for you. See, a lot of times, a lot of times we, we stay wrapped up in our own self and our own way of doing things and our own uh, traditions and our, we move away from people. But if we really want to take the initiative, if we really want to reach out, if we really want to show love, we can't move away from people. We got to take the initiative and move towards people. In order to show love to people, guess what you got to do? You got to move towards them. If we're really going to, to, to be love in action, then we've got to learn to go towards people and not away from them. Guess what? In order to build relationships, guess what you got to do? You got to move towards people instead of moving away from people. He showed compassion. He also showed some care. He stopped. He took some oil and some wine, his traveling medicine kit of the day, and he poured it in this man's wounds. And he, 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 he put him on his own donkey. And it's important to recognize he took his time. And obviously, reading from the text, he had other things to do. But, but he cared so much until he changed his schedule. This was such an important thing to do. He changed his schedule in order to meet this man's needs. How many times does God present us with an opportunity? And I'm sorry, I got an appointment, I got to go. And we don't change our schedule. I won't go to the text, but you remember Acts chapter 8, the case of the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember what the spirit told Philip, go south towards Gaza, which is a desert, and, and wait there. And, and when the chariot came by, Philip was in the right place at the right time. Wonder if Philip would have told the spirit, no, I'm not going south, I'm going west. And uh, you're just on your own. No, we got to be willing to change our schedule and go towards people and be where God wants us to be when God wants us to be there. Not only did he show some care, he, he, uh, he spent some money. Now this one's going to step on some toes. So either move your feet or get ready. Because a lot of times we say we care, but when it costs us something, especially money, oh, no, absolutely not. And I'm convinced, grab on to something, brace yourself, okay? I'm convinced copper wire was invented by the way some of us stretch a penny. I'm convinced. I am convinced of it. This man gave some money. I really don't care. My truck is pointed west, and it's got gas in it. And all I got to do is get to the nearest door. Oh, there's one, and I'm out. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. He gave him some money. He took care of him. And he put no limit on how much money this innkeeper was going to spend. Realize that this Samaritan was also in danger. He was in enemy territory. He was vulnerable. And get this. It would be like, it would be like you going to a, a place of business today and you give them your credit card and say, here, uh, charge whatever you need on this. And if you spend extra, I'll, I'll pay you when I come back. You know what that tells me? Two things. Number one, he had good credit. <laughs> he had good credit. I, I don't know why I'm laughing. Oh, I, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. He had good credit. And he had a good relationship with that innkeeper, with that shopkeeper. Obviously, they had some kind of relationship. There was trust factor already built in. Remember, the Samaritan was in enemy territory, and he was also vulnerable. This is significant because in order to reach people, if we're going to show this love that we're talking about, that we espouse with our lips, then we're going to have to be vulnerable also. And vulnerability is essential 
is essential for meeting the needs of other people. So let me wrap this up. What's the big deal? And, and Trent, Trent knows this always in my, my, my lessons. There's always a so what. Okay? Brother Fumble, I heard you. I believe the scriptures and, and everything's fine. So what? What, what does that mean? All I wanted to do was come to church today, take my communion, give my 50 cents, say that I worship, and leave. Well, okay, bye. Bye. But those of us who are really interested in learning and wanting to change, here's the so what to that particular parable. Here's what the big deal really is all about. Here, here is the meaning to everything that, that we need to know when it comes to this text. Number one, and there are three, and then I'll let you go. Number one, even our enemies are our neighbors. If I'm really going to show the love of God and the love of Christ, then I've got to get to the fact that even people that don't like Fred Famble, and that's a hard thing to grasp because everybody likes Fred Famble, <laughs> but even our enemies are our neighbors. We can't get mad at somebody and say, I, my father had an expression, he's gone now, but it still rings true in my mind. And, and, and he meant this from a negative place. I've just kind of turned it around um, as a positive thing. You know, he used to say, Greg, I don't care about you or nobody that looked like you. I'm like, what, well, dad, really? <laughs> but the point is, if we're really going to be Christians about this, then we're going to have to realize that even our enemies are our neighbors and we are bound and, and scripturally obligated to serve. My children used to get in a fight at home and they would, they would argue and sometimes we would, you know, hear some scuttling in the room and unless it got to a certain decibel level, I wasn't moving. I, I wasn't moving. But, you know, I'd hear them, you know, I love you, but I don't like you right now. It's like, okay, no blood, anybody bleed? Okay, they're good, they're good. Even our enemies, even our enemies are our neighbors. Number two, our ethical and our social standing is no guarantee of our right relationship with God. Just because we may have been born in a certain family or born on the right side of the tracks, whatever that means, that does not guarantee my relationship with God is intact or it guarantees me to get into heaven. And I say, let the church be the church. If we're going, to, and I've said this before, not here, but I've said this before in Trent, the church is the only institution that can teach the world how to get along in spite of differences. It's the only, we are the only institution that can teach the world different is okay. But we haven't been being the church because we've been acting just like them instead of showing the love of God abroad in our hearts. Third and final, the Samaritan's actions are an example of what true Christianity is all about. Jesus said at the end of the parable, go, that's an action word, and do likewise. All of that is about action. But a lot of us, we really just want the, the, the ability to say, yep, we went to church today. Really? Well, what did y'all, did, did you learn anything? Nope, but I went to church. Really? See, we got to let the church be the church. And I say, and I've said this in Trent, and I mean this, I would rather have folk full of church than a church full of folk. I would rather be associated with brothers and sisters. And we talked about this in the Bible class. The, the, the Luke says in Acts that these 12 men turn the world upside down. I would have, rather have 12 people with me who are willing to turn the world upside down than to have 120 that I got to drag and pull and keep trying to pump up. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me, and I'm, I'm, I'm done. Don't misunderstand me. I will encourage you when you need to be encouraged. I will pray with you when you need to be prayed with. I will pray for you when you need to be prayed for. But you know what? The minute you decide that you do not want to obey God, what can I do? I, you and I can do nothing. So three things as the takeaway this morning from this lesson. 
on the Good Samaritan. Number one, even our enemies are our neighbors. Number two, your ethical and social standing is no guarantee of a right standing before God. We have to let the church be the church. And then the Samaritan's actions are the example of what it means to love God. You remember the scripture, John uh, 13, 34 and 35? By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. If you have what? You remember? Love one for another. And one of the things that we have to do is we have to put our Bible where our mouth is. We really say we love, then the next opportunity after we leave this building, don't pass by an opportunity to serve. Nowhere do we read in scripture after the, the, the man was left at the end. We don't read anywhere in scripture whatever happened later. You know why? Because that wasn't the point. The point is, what action are you going to take now to do what God wants you to do? What action are you going to take to magnify and to glorify God? You know, the invitation time in our worship service, we, we, we kind of over, we skip over this or we gloss over it, but it really is a time of self-examination and reflection. And no, it's just not something that we traditionally do. It's something that is a time of internal reflection. How am I right now in my standing with God? Have I committed sin in my life that's making me stand a guilty distance away from God? If the answer to that comes back, yes, then we don't need to leave this building without coming forward and asking for prayer. We need to be able to say, you know, I messed up. I've sinned. I've fallen short of the glory of God. I can't handle this thing that I'm dealing with on my own. Brothers and sisters, I'm vulnerable right now. I need y'all to pray for me. And you know, when people do that, and I don't say this a lot, but I'm going to say it now. When people come down and ask for prayer and express vulnerability, we don't need to leave and go home and talk about them. We don't need to go home. Did you see Brother Fambo came down? He must be beating his wife. What, really? Seriously? <laughs> we need to be free. We need to, I told you, my truck, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. But we need to, if we're going to really be the church that, that you read about in your Bible, then we need to be vulnerable one with another. If you need to ask for prayer, in just a minute, we're going to sing a song. And, and if you need to ask for prayer, come forward. Or if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible says everybody who comes to God, comes to God the same way. You've got to hear the gospel. Believe it, repent of your sins, confess Christ, and be willing to be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. Based on that act of obedience, the Bible says, then God will add you to his congregational family. And let me say a word on this. That doesn't mean the end. That is merely the beginning. That is the beginning of our relationship and our walk with God. Then we as brothers and sisters, we lock hands in hand. And we lock elbow to elbow and your problems become my problems and we encourage each other. And so much the more, the book says, as we see the day approaching. If you have a need, something that we can pray for or a Bible question that we can answer or whatever we can do to help you in your Christian walk, we invite you to come now as we stand and sing the song of invitation.